I'd like to talk to you about Evagrius of Pontus. He was a 4th century desert father. Okay, okay, I can see your eyes glazing over. Why should I be interested in a 4th century desert father? Well, I hope by the end of this talk, you will know why. He was quite a pivotal figure in Christianity, full stop not just in the spiritual mystical tradition. When I say the next sentence, you're going to say, hmm, I thought Christianity at the beginning, in the first few centuries, they were all of one agreement. Well, no. Nowadays, we have a split between fundamentalism and more mystical, spiritual tradition. I'm afraid to say in the second century, it was exactly the same. We had a Christianity on the one hand that stressed pure faith and an unquestioning acceptance of a set of belief based on a agreed uh, scriptures and the only criteria for being a true Christian was that. That's all you had to do. But the other group said, yeah, that's, that's a good idea, that's a good foundation, but it's only a foundation. You need to go deeper. You need to go into contemplative prayer. And there acquire intuitive, spiritual knowledge, spirit-led insights in silence, communicated in silence, spirit-led experiences. And they could emerge from reading scripture. You read scripture with attention and then the silence follows and the insight comes. So there are two distinct ways. One, I'm telling you what to believe and you're saved. The second one, yep, you need to know what you believe, but you also need the experience of deep, silent, contemplative prayer. So that's quite a surprise for some of you that that division already existed then. Now, Evagrius was uh, friends of the Cappadocian fathers. You may not know them, but they're all important people who have made the orthodox uh, faith established. Yeah, you had uh, Basil, Saint Basil, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, these were the important people who decided what do we really believe as Christians. And Evagrius was part of, in that circle. But the interesting thing is, he fell for the wife of a Roman official. And that was not a good idea. And from there his life completely changed. And he went and became one of the foremost desert fathers. Now, when I talk about desert fathers and mothers, you have to remember I'm talking about the fourth century and there was a flowering of mystical spiritual prayer. It was the, the really an, an, an amazing time. I keep asking my husband to make a time machine. I want to go back there and see what really happened in the desert. So he was both. He was a theologian who emphasized deep spiritual prayer. So both was needed. He said, in fact, um, that a theologian is one who prays and one who prays is a theologian. And all the, his theology came out of prayer. First prayer, then the theology. 
and it's become the other way around over time. He was steeped in scripture, but he stressed it's not enough. It's not enough. The effects of keeping the commandments do not suffice to heal the powers of the soul completely. They must be complemented by a contemplative activity and this activity must penetrate to the spirit. Do you see? The experience first and then, so the experience of the heart first and then the mind makes sense of what the heart has experienced. And the insights, the grace come again in this moment of the heart. So do remember that if you're a theologian, you truly pray. And if you truly pray, you are a theologian. So he was at the center of the whole Christian development, which really got crystallized around the fourth century. I've already mentioned that he was friends with St. Basil and St. Gregory of Nyssa, so greatly influenced from them. And St. Gregory of Nyssa is the whole Eastern tradition of the Hesychast tradition, which becomes the Jesus prayer. And he influenced Cassian, John Cassian. John Cassian sat at the feet of Evagrius in the desert and other desert fathers, but mainly Evagrius. And when you read John Cassian, you're actually reading Evagrius. Evagrius says it in a few words. Cassian needs lots of words, but it is the same idea. So he's the spring for both Eastern and Western Christianity. He is revered in both camps. So for us, it is interesting because in the world community, John Cassian is the source for John Main. So it comes up again into our uh, 20th century. And do you again see those two strands? Yeah, we are rediscovering the second strand, which was stressed by Evagrius. We are rediscovering that from the 20th century onwards. All of a sudden, up came the emphasis on contemplative prayer. I don't, it's, I don't even need to mention all the names. And all stress the same thing that Evagrius stressed knowledge of the scriptures, absolutely basic, but it has to be complemented with a contemplative practice. Well, we still have him. Look at that, a very modern edition of Evagrius with his two main works that you can read now as much as all those centuries ago, the Practicos and the chapter on prayer. Again, these are short sentences which are there to make you think. He gives advice, he's talking to people of his time, helping them with prayer and to prepare with prayer, but they're short sentences, so you have to read them attentively and let them sink in the silence to come to the true meaning. So the practicus and the chapter on prayer. And what I love is I'm a practical woman, and that's why I always love John Main. He tells you how it is, what to do, so does Evagrius. The first thing he starts with is giving advice of the difficulties you may have on the spiritual path. 
Now we can certainly do with that. Short sentences tell you. And in fact, to him, prayer is essentially therapy leading to wholeness of being, oneness with God, and harmony with others. That's the reason for contemplative prayer. He was a brilliant psychologist and he starts in the practicos, he starts straight away with a problem we all know, thoughts, the problem of thoughts. Unless we can let go of thoughts temporarily, prayer is difficult. He says, if the flask is left standing for a little while, the scum sinks to the bottom and the water becomes clear and transparent. In a similar way, our heart, once it is restful and steeped in profound silence, can reflect God. Now, thoughts. He is not interested in our superficial thoughts. We all know when we try to pray, we think of all the things we haven't done, or what we have to do, or what is for dinner. No, he is talking about thoughts that actually form the matrix of our being of our psychological and emotional being. They're basically egocentric drives, which we need for survival. And he calls them greed, unchastity, avarice, envy, sadness, anger, Echadia, I'll say more about that, vainglory and pride. Well, let me explain that a bit. Greed leads to wanting to possess anything, including people, hence unchastity. Then on to avarice, you want to hold on to what you've got. Then on to envy. Other people have got what you want. And then finally to either depression or anger because you don't get what you want. So can you see how psychologically sound it is? And he says that forms our matrix out of which we operate. What are the drives? And he calls it the demons. Well, they could well become a kind of demonic obsession. I mean, how, how often have you heard of millionaires who become billionaires and multi-billionaires and it still is not enough? They still haven't got the security they want. And then vainglory and pride just hijacks everything you do into um, self-centeredness, into the ego. And he says in another book, in Philokala, the Philokalia, very nice, very good, wonderful book, of the demons opposing us in the practice of the ascetic life, there are three groups who fight in the front line. Those entrusted with the appetites of greed, those who suggest envious thoughts, and those who incite us to seek the esteem of others. All the other demons follow behind and in turn attack those already wounded by the first three groups. I'm smiling because you all know those three demons, greed, envy and looking for fame and esteem. So nothing much has changed in 2000 years. Now Evagrius says, his advice is, this is our matrix, but we just need to become aware. Become aware of what are 
are our drives, become aware of that. Then we can grow spiritually and nothing of that can be done without silent prayer. What he is talking about, folks, is what you read in every newspaper, mindfulness. He is talking about mindfulness. Here we have our very first mindfulness teacher. Fourth century from the desert. He says, keep careful watch over your thoughts. And then he adds, then ask from Christ the explanation of the data you have received. Again, can you see? Self-analytical, become aware of your thoughts, and then comes grace. The answer doesn't come from your mind, but is a gift when you go into the silence of your heart. And this mindfulness of Evagrius is not just watching the thoughts. He starts with awareness of sensations, of feelings, of emotions. Then he comes to thoughts. That causes thoughts. Thoughts cause desires. And then you're into the action and you're lost. Or you write a beautiful book, whatever it is. But there is a very clear train of thought. And you know about, those of you who know about mindfulness, know exactly that that is what you're asked to pay attention to. And I love it. There's that desert father who is teaching us. He says the passions, he calls them passions, thoughts or demons, are accustomed to be stirred up by the senses. That is your first one. All these thoughts he mentions, the ones that you need to become aware of, just need to be purified, not uprooted, not got rid of. You have to just be aware of them so that over time, they come purified into the original divine energy they were. We have just subverted the energy into our ego drives for survival. And when we come um, to his chapters on prayer, we can see that mindfulness and prayer are working together. It's not just mindfulness. Without the silence in prayer that gives you the insight, you're only halfway there. And if you do that, if you do both, then Evagrius is absolutely convinced that you will discover the divine image within and you will achieve divine likeness. There's no doubt about it. So again, it isn't a question, you might earn it or achieve it. No, you will get it, if only you are aware of what you're doing. And there are ways, he gives you clear ways of getting to this place of silence getting to this place of awareness of the divine. The first one is nature. Nature he sees as the manifestation of the unmanifest. And then scripture, deep attentive reading, again, where you will meet the divine presence of Christ in there. See it as an encounter. And if things don't go well, don't despair. Don't despair at all. You do not have to be perfect at the start of the journey, according to Evagrius. He says, the Holy Spirit takes compassion on our weakness. And though we are impure, 
He often comes to visit us. And if he should find our spirit praying to him out of love for the truth, he then descends upon it and dispels the whole army of thought and reasoning that beset it. And there you go. You don't have to do it. All you have to do is try and you will have help. When it comes to prayer, it is the basic teaching we get from everywhere. Let go of your thoughts. Concentrate on your word. All the desert fathers took scripture words and you will sink into the silence with the help of the spirit and the angels. If they're demons, there are also angels. Because when the demons say, see that you are really fervent in your prayer, they will help you. All this practice, all this mindfulness, this deep contemplative prayer is never about our own spiritual advancement. It is not about that. But it is about the experience of unconditional love for everyone, leading to harmony and unity with all. And I will let have a Vargas have the last word in this. Happy is the monk who views the welfare and progress of all men and women with as much joy as if it were his own.